everybody else is ready. We are going. Hi, everybody. Welcome to AID. Uh, my name is Matthew Perry. Not, not that one. Uh, that one. Does anybody know what CCP stands for? Is anybody in the room old enough to know what CCP stands for? Actually, stands for Certified Computer Professional. It's a, it's a degree that it's a degree you used to be able to get back in the '90s, working with the IBM stuff. Uh, I used to be a board member of AID. Uh, I'm a board member and treasurer of the 304 Geeks. Uh, I help run a conference here in uh, Charleston called HackerCon. It's in uh, September. You guys look it up. Everybody should come. Uh, I work right now at the Masters Law Firm. I'm a network administrator and a detective. I run an online gaming uh, group called Red Sky. That's a picture of the family. And I'm actually a licensed minister. Um, so what does that mean? I really do. Well, you know, I do litigation support, trial support, network admin, database analysis, box carrier, hacker, and I'm a little bit of a social engineer. So at the end of the day, I'm really just a computer guy. Um, today's talk is about uh, ransomware. We got hit at work twice. And uh, you know, on the first day of uh, seminary school, my professor said, the key to a good sermon is you have a good opening and a good closing, and you don't make them very far apart. So I'm going to give you guys the secret to surviving ransomware right at the beginning. And then we'll go through a little bit about what ransomware is and how it goes. But the secret to surviving ransomware is, real simple, backups. You've got to have good backups, and we'll talk about that. And the secret to having good backups is this. No, not those guys, but keep it simple. Keep it really simple. Um, pick whatever kind of backup you want to do. Tape backups. Uh, off-site backups, cloud backups, doesn't matter, but you have to do them. Uh, you know, and, and this, this really hit home to me back when I, I used to work at the Sheriff's Department, and um, we had a reel-to-reel -reel tape backup, and man, that thing was, it was, it was ridiculously hard to use, and I made the mistake of never testing it. So, consequently, we had a data, we had a hardware failure, and I had a big problem. Um, this uh, survey company did a survey of IT professionals over 300 organizations and found and nearly 100% reported that they were actively backing up their data. And out of those that had not yet experienced a ransomware attack, 81% said they were confident that they would be able to recover uh, any of the data that the attackers encrypted, encrypted without paying the ransom. However, as you can see from the bottom, of the professionals that had, that had been hit by a ransomware attack, only 42% were able to successfully recover their data. And the mo main reason for that was because of unmonitored and failed backups. As a matter of fact, the, the reason I have the job uh, that I have now is because of a failed backup. Uh, the, at, the, at the law firm, their server crashed, and they went to restore from the backup, and it was, it was empty. And they called me to help them recover their data, and that's how I ended up getting a job there. So the moral of the story with backups is you test, test, and test. If you've got a backup and you haven't ever restored from it, then it's not really a backup. This is how I do my backups. It's real simple. I just wrote this little batch file that runs on my computer at night at 8 o'clock, and it copies everything to a, to a uh, one of the network access storage devices. And then I have an incremental backup. We'll talk about that uh, later in, uh, at, at the end. Um, so now that I've told you the secret to surviving ransomware, let's talk a little bit. Oh, this, is, this is the screen that pops up on my computer every morning when I come into work, and I check it every day just to make sure that it worked right. So what is ransomware? Ransomware is a type of malware that affects computer systems, restricts access uh, to the infected systems. There are a lot of variants going around, and it's evolved over time. Uh, but most of the time, uh, they ask you for money uh, to get your stuff unencrypted. How does ransomware work? 
Well, there are several methods that you can get infected. You get most popular is, of course, email attachments. Uh, you can get infected by what, by going to the wrong website and having malicious code downloaded to your system. You can get infected from a bad USB drive. Or you can actually get infected through an instant messenger uh, file or link. And here's a... Uh, each ransomware variant is engineered to operate a little differently. However, the common traits include a fairly complex stealth techniques and covert launch mechanisms meant to avoid uh, early antivirus detection, including obscure file names, modifying file attributes, and operating under the pretense of legitimate programs and services. And as an example, uh, CryptoLocker, which is one of the more uh, widespread uh, ransomwares. Uh, it gets installed by a uh, Zbot variant, and that's a Trojan, uh, an email Trojan. And after execution, it adds itself to the startup uh, under a random file name and tries to communicate uh, with the, its own command and control server. And if it can, then you, it gets a public key and a Bitcoin address, and then it encrypts the files on your computer, and it does over 70 different file types. So why does ransomware work? Well, the main reason is this. Because you clicked it. Not many people in here know Boris, but he's famous for saying, don't click stuff. So that's the main reason ransomware works, is because people clicked it. The second reason is because most people have a disaster recovery plan like this. And then the last reason, of course, why it works is because people just don't have good backups. So where does ransomware come from? There's been a couple of stories in the news. Uh, the Dutch police busted a couple of kids who were uh, running a ransomware scam. Uh, here's an article about uh, ra ra ransomware uh, scam people from China. But at the end of the day, roll Bill's attribution dice, and you just come up with wherever ransomware could be from. Why can't anyone stop it? Well, just like Smokey the Bear says, the only real way to stop ransomware is you have to stop it yourself. Uh, nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody's going to protect you. The government can't protect you. Doesn't matter how many air bases we blow up in Syria, there's still going to be ransomware. And the other thing is, ransomware works, and it's so popular because people pay. You know, back in the old days when email first started and everybody got thousands of mail enhancement emails in their junk mailbox every day, the reason people were sending those out is because somebody someplace was buying them. They weren't just doing it for fun. And that's what the deal is with ransomware. People are paying, so as long as people are keep, keep paying, there's going to keep being ransomware. So here's the first attack that... Uh, I was hit with. It was uh, Christmas time, 2015, and of course all the supervisors in the office were on vacation, and um, I came into work one morning and I checked my backup screen and I saw that. I thought, that's not good. So I go walking around the office and I find a computer at this lady's desk that had that screen on it. And it was telling me what I needed to do to get my data back. Now, I started looking around on my file server. And fortunately, this version of CryptoWare only attacked drives that were mapped on her computer. So she could see the main server drive, and she could see the drive where our document, back at, our document management system was, and in her C drive. That was it. And interestingly enough, this version of uh, ransomware had an error in its code because it crashed out at the old two gigabyte file limit. So it only encrypted the first two gigabytes of my server, fortunately for me. So what the aggravating thing about this ransomware attack was, this was, uh, this was on her computer and it had been on there since the day before. And I asked her about it, and I said, "Did you you, you, know, you you see that, right? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, well, why didn't you call me? She said, well, I don't know. I just opened an email, and that popped up, and I didn't know what to do. 
and needless to say, oh, she didn't work there anymore. So this is how I fixed it. I first called my friend Bill. That was his reaction. But then I deleted all the encrypted stuff, and I restored it from the backup. That was it. I took her machine out of service, didn't even, didn't even attempt to clean it. I just nuked it, wiped out the hard drive, started over on hers. Now, the second attack I had was in the uh, summer. It was in last summer. I was about to go to launch, and I have an incremental backup that runs during the day, uh, and it, it has a little window on my screen, and I, so I can kind of watch as the files go by. And all of a sudden, this stuff started popping up. And I thought, oh, that's not good. So I jump up from my desk, run around to the computers in the office, and sure enough, I find one with that on it. And inter this situation was a little different because as I walk into the room, the secretary looks at me and she says, I'm glad you're here. I was about to call you. Um, I tried to open an email and with a picture in it, and it didn't work. And I was just getting ready to call you. I said, oh, okay, well, and then as I was yanking her computer out of the wall and carrying it back down to my office, I said, okay, thanks. So this version of ransomware, uh, Zepta, worked a little differently in that it ignored what drive she was mapped to, and it just went out and scanned the network. And it started at what would have been the lowest drive, so like my Z drive, and it started encrypting there, which oddly enough was my backup drive. So the main server was fine, but it encrypted the backup. And so um, I really didn't suffer any loss in this because I just deleted the backup and made a new one. So let's talk about building a defense uh, against ransomware, which is the project I've been going on at work for for the last 18 months and it's a it's a progressive thing and and after after every attack of course I had to change and get better uh, but the first thing to know about building a defense is it has to be in layers just like onions and ogres it has to be in layers the most important thing and the first line of defense is always training and education you know, the, the first lady in the, in the, uh, that I told the story about from the first attack, she didn't speak up. I don't know why she didn't call me, but that was the main problem I had with her. Now, the second lady, she was going to call me, and I believed her when she told me that uh, because it was lunchtime. And it was right at the beginning of lunch, and she said she was going to call me after lunch. So I've made a big deal about now, you know, as soon as you see something, I would rather get field 10 calls a day from people asking me if this email is okay to open than I would spend a bunch of time fixing one of these. The second thing is report something. If you do click on something, and everybody clicks on something they shouldn't at some point in time. I have, everybody in this room has, at some point in time you've clicked on something and after you clicked on it you thought, eh, I shouldn't have done that. Well the key is you have to tell. And this is the screen that people get, I've started using a, a piece of software called Hitman Pro and I've got all my staff now trained to see, but if they see that screen, they better call. Now, how do you tell if an email is dangerous? And that's the, this is the first, obviously the first big part of uh, the education that you have to go through with everybody. So here's a few examples. These are going to be really hard to see, I have a feeling, but the, the, the main thing is, the first thing you got to look at is the URL. But, you know, the, the thing about this email that's striking to me, and, and, and I'll tell this story. Um, you know, this is an email from British Airways, and I, I don't know why somebody would click on this, because the first thing you have to ask yourself is, well, did, did you buy a ticket on British Airways? Why would they be talking to you? And that seems silly, but, you know, I had a lawyer in my office, and this is a guy who'd been to law school, been a law clerk for a federal judge, practices law, could be representing you or someone in your family in a, in a case. And he calls me and he says, Matt, you have to help me. I won the Canadian lottery. And it says on this email that I have to do some stuff to claim the prize. And I said, let me ask you a question. 
did you buy a ticket in the Canadian lottery? And he said, well, no. And I said, well, then why do you think you won? Well, because this email. I said, you didn't really win. That's a fake email. Please tell me you didn't click anything. And, of course, he had, and he got a virus on his computer. So, you know, the first thing you have to, you have to beat into your users' heads is, is the email legitimate? The other thing I teach my, you know, you, you teach everybody, look at the spelling, look at the grammar, hover over the links in the email and see if, if, if they match who the email is coming from. Is it some, something you were expecting? Uh, here's another good example. Uh, you know, the email, the, the subject line is bad, and, you know, the attachment is a, is a dot .zip. I just quit accepting dot .zips at work. I, I, we, just, we just quit taking them. If, if another law firm sends us something and it's a zip, I, I tell them they have to sit, Dropbox it or send it some other way. We just don't take them. Um, this is a good one. Everybody gets these fake shipping emails. And, you know, if you're not expecting a package, uh, then, you know, don't even bother looking at it. Um, you know, it was the email sent to, if you look at your, if you look at an email and there's 37 addresses and who it was going to and you don't know any of them, then, you know, that's obviously fake. Um, and, and, you know, there's, this one's from Germany. I mean, do you even know anybody in Germany? It's just obvious things that you, but you really have to beat these into your users' heads over and over and over again. This is an example from, uh, this is one of our emails. This one's very close to the one that was the, um, caused the first attack. Uh, it's a zip, and it's about an invoice. To, uh, what got me about this one is, you know, look at the country code in the email. I'm not sure where ES is. I guess it's Estonia. Um, you know, why would we be getting an email from there to begin with? Why would you even be opening that? And then this one was uh, very close to the second one. Now, what, this, the lady who got hit with the second uh, attack, her, the email that got her was very clever because, and it was really kind of lucky because we had a client whose name was Rita, and uh, the, and it was this lady's client, a case she was working on, and she was expecting her to send some pictures, oddly enough. And so she got an email. This is not the exact same one, but. She got an email that said Rita at, and then it just had a, a generic email address, and it said, and it was a GIF. Now, it was a GIF.zip like this, but it was a GIF. And so she thought, it, so it was really kind of a perfect storm uh, that she got caught up in. Now, so I started investigating, after education, I started investigating some other solutions to, to try and help this and, and make it stop. Uh, first thing you can look at is, you know, call your call your email vendor uh, and see if they have uh, spam filtering, virus filtering at the source, you know, whoever your host is. They can filter out some of this stuff. Um, the next thing, and this happened, uh, this is handy for a lot of things other than ransomware, especially um, spam stuff. I had a buddy of mine in Oklahoma City that got uh, email bombed. I mean, he was getting five or 6,000 emails a day uh, because he had been somebody had subscribed him to all these listservs, uh, and he couldn't get out of all of them. I mean, he was, as he was trying to do it, it would, he, they were coming faster than he could deal with. So I helped him implement whitelisting, and there's some interesting whitelisting solutions out there. Basically, it's you only get emails from people that you allow to get emails from. Now, you know, in some businesses, you probably can't do that, but it helped, uh, it helped Dan, and uh, it's, it's good practice. Hardware solutions. Well, you know, everybody needs a firewall to keep the devil and the death and the fiery skulls out. Uh, you know, and everybody likes a good blinky light box. Uh, some firewalls can, uh, can do content filtering, email content filtering. Uh, they tend to be slow, and they tend to be expensive. There's some good software solutions that you can install on everybody's desktop. I really like Hitman Pro. Uh, it was cheap for our office, like 600 bucks for 30 installs um, and for three years, uh, and it runs really well. Uh, the other one's Malwarebytes. Uh, 
it, it similar to Hitman Pro, but you know, I called them about a uh, about a solution for my office, and I said I needed uh, thirty licenses, and they said, "Ah, oh, we don't think we could do one that small." So they were they were for obviously for much bigger uh, much bigger organizations. Another important thing to do uh, is check your security settings on your uh, on on everybody's computer. And this is something I'm in the middle of right now is, you know, th this the concept of the least privilege. So have everybody's security settings, to set everything to no, and then only turn on the things that they gripe about not being able to do. That's kind of, that's kind of the policy I'm implementing right now. And, and then the, the newest one I'm going to do is the new round of computers I'm going to install. Nobody is going to be admin on their own PC. Everybody's just going to have a user account. And then I'm going to be the admin on everybody's PC because the machines that we have now, everybody has an admin account. And so I'm going to, just on their PC, but I'm going to switch that uh, to everybody just having a plain user admin. And then I disabled macros on everybody's system. You know, nobody needs, um, nobody needs to be able to run all those macros on Word stuff. Now, the next thing is what I talked about at the beginning, layered backups. And this is kind of how, this is an outline of my, how mine kind of works. Uh, I do a daily backup at night to the network uh, storage device. I do a daily backup to a local hard drive. And I started doing that because of the second uh, ransomware attack. You know, that the Zepto was able to scan the, my entire network and see everything. So I needed a place to back up to that wasn't shared. Uh, so I, I'm doing. A, I have a local a local device that just hooked 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 up to my PC that uh, I do a backup to every day. Uh, I do a daily incremental backup to a pen drive that goes with the uh, and I carry it with me all the time. Uh, that goes with me home to the uh, offsite backup. Uh, and then I have a weekly. Here's my daily incremental backup. Um, do a weekly backup to a different hard drive, quarterly to a still different hard drive, and then I update the off-site backup every three months. Um, now something else you may want to look at, uh, especially if you have a business loss insurance policy already, uh, is making sure that you have cyber insurance, cyber loss insurance. So does your insurance have an exclusion for data loss? It may. And if it does, then you have to have a cyber insurance uh, policy or rider to your insurance. And then, even if you have a cyber insurance policy or rider, then you have to check out the cyber extortion clause to make sure that you're covered for ransomware. Or check the limits and the deductible. The deductible's too high. It's probably it might be worthless anyway. Um, the last thing I'm just going to the next thing I'm just going to briefly mention. Um, is, you know, what is a Bitcoin? And I never recommend paying for any of these, but, and I'm not going to go into how to get a Bitcoin and how all that works, but, you know, you just go to Bitcoin.com and you can start reading about it. We were kind of having a discussion out in the hallway a minute ago about uh, Bitcoins and uh, the, the wallet that you have to get and all the personal information that you have to put in there. Um, but it might be a good idea to at least familiarize yourself with it until you're having to do it in an emergency situation. So, oh man, you got hit. What do you do now? Because sooner or later, everybody's going to get hit, whether you want to or not, whether you want to be or not, no matter how careful you are, no matter how prepared you think you are. So the first thing is, how do you know you got hit? Well, I know because I check my backups and my data every day, a couple times a day. I, I, I view this screen in the morning every time when I come in and then I look at it again at least once a day just to make sure there's nothing that looks like that. The other thing, the first thing to do is you got to find the entry point and so if you got hit somewhere on your network there'll be a PC that has this on the desktop and the first thing these always encrypt is the stuff that's on the desktop and then the C drive and then they jump out from there. So there'll be a desktop someplace that has that on it. 
Now, you know, if you can remote log into all your desktops, that makes it easy. I have to get up and run around, check with everybody and look at them all, but you'll find one. The next thing to do is to stop the infection from spreading, and the easiest way to do that is this. Just yank her out of the wall. That's what I did both times. Um, then you have to start looking to see how bad it was. Uh, get on your server, start doing some searching. You know, all these tend to uh, have the same, like Zepto names all the files .zepto, so you can just do a search and see where all it went. Uh, and then they all have a little HTML file at the, that they put in every folder that has that instruction screen. You can search for that uh, and see how bad it is. And then this is something uh, Jason Street tweeted the uh, day before yesterday, uh, a news article about this website called No More Ransom, and that's their, uh, that's their URL. And what they have is a bunch of unencryption tools that they have uh, posted on their website so that maybe you can unencrypt your stuff yourself without, uh, without having to pay. And this was put up by, you can see it was put up by there, the Dutch police, Interpol, and uh, Intel and Kapersky. And I looked, I was looked on there yesterday, and they, it's, it's the, they have a bunch of different types of ransomwares that they can uh, help you unencrypt. So then the next thing, well, you got hit, what do you do? Well, at the end of the day, you just delete it, restore it, and move on. Any questions, comments, queries? Yes, Mr. Gardner? Yes, this will be on the final. And it was on the syllabus. Anybody else? Yes. It will. Well, the gamble in that is, I'm assuming that it's not gonna it's not gonna encrypt my device. See, because if I don't trigger the ransomware, then it's not gonna get to my PC. You see what I'm saying? Because see, my drive is not shared on the network. So unless I trip the ransomware, it's not gonna get the local device that I have on my PC. Now, if I screw up and trip the ransomware, then you're right. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and, and in my case, in both instances in my case, it did ignore that because my document management system has its own backup, like you're talking about. And it doesn't back up into a zip. It has its own, it's .tm, because the name of the program is called Time Matters. And it backs up into a .tm. Well, the, both versions of ransomware, that T, .tm wasn't on its list. So in both instances, my document management system and its backups were untouched because the extensions were not on its list that it looks at. Um, but yeah, the, the ones that I, it was basically the same as the ones that you're talking about. You know, I, I lost all my docs. I lost all my 
Excels. I lost all my PowerPoints. I lost all my PDFs. Um, you know, those are the main ones that they're going to look for anyway. Now, the the um, interestingly enough, we did have some. You know, I have some very very old uh, data that was Word Perfect data uh, from. I mean, from years ago, uh, legacy stuff from very old cases that we keep just for reference, and didn't get those. This is too old. Uh, so yeah, you know that's a valid point. You know, if you if you if you have a backup archive system that uh, you can kind of hide in plain view if you're an extension that's not on the list. Yeah, go ahead. So you may get the infection, but it but it won't act. It won't start encrypting because, because it can't go back, back to the command and control server. Yeah. Right. Right. Because it can't get the key. Yeah. That, oh, that's good. <laughs> That's true. Probably true. Yeah, the firewall too. You block it from, you know, you gotta get key or key and key to go off and say, hey, I'm gonna go find my, uh, get my command and control there. No, it's gonna go get the key or <laughs> Right. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, guys. Tell Adrian to come back in and turn the turn the camera off. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you, man.